Play it today. Lesson two. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about the left hand. Have a look at the first page of your lesson two booklet, and you'll see that the fingers of the left hand are numbered in the same way as those of the right hand. That is, the thumb is one, the index finger two, the middle finger three, the ring finger four, and the little finger five. Generally speaking, the left hand plays the notes written in the bass clef. Look at the drawing in the middle of page 13, which shows some of the keyboard notes and their corresponding positions on the treble and bass clefs. You can see that the three black notes on the treble clef, D, E and F, are the notes you've already learned to play with your right hand. The D, E and F notes on the bass clef are also shown in black. The other notes that you haven't played yet are shown in red. When you're ready, place your left hand on the keyboard and find lower C, that is, the first C to the left of middle C. Put your little finger, finger number five, on this C note, your fourth finger on the D next to it, your third finger on E, your second on F, and your first, in other words your thumb, on G. Now we're going to practice the falling movement of the hand you learnt in lesson one, but this time with the left hand instead of the right. If you've forgotten this exercise, have another look at pages six and seven of your lesson one booklet and refresh your memory. Let your left arm hang down by your side. Then lift your left forearm slowly, keeping your hand relaxed, and allow your third finger to fall onto the keyboard so that it strikes the E note. Repeat this movement, this time letting your second finger strike the note F. And then, with your fourth finger, strike D. Keep holding D down. Now we'll repeat the three finger exercise which you played with your right hand in lesson one. Check that you're holding your wrist correctly. Then, keeping your hand steady, play E and F. Remember, each finger should move freely from the first joint and hit the key just as the finger before it is coming up. This way you'll be playing joined up sounds, or legato as musicians call it. Make sure too that you keep your hands steady and your fingers curved in the right way. A glance back at page eight of your lesson one booklet will remind you of the correct position. You're now ready to play exercise five on page 13. The time signature at the beginning tells us that this is in 4-4 four, four time, while the notes themselves are all crotchets, that is, quarter notes worth one beat each. Listen to the exercise being played through first, starting with the four beats of the metronome that mark out the time. Now let's move on to exercise six on page 14, which you can see is composed of semibreves worth four beats and minims worth two beats. Listen to it played with the metronome.
exercise seven uses the left and right hands alternately. So the musical stave is shown complete, with the bass clef under the treble clef. This exercise gives you a chance to practice the notes on the treble clef you learnt in lesson one, along with the three notes in the bass clef which you've just been playing. Listen to it now. Let's go back to the right hand. First of all, we're going to use the thumb, finger number one, and the little finger, finger number five, to play the notes C and G. The drawing at the top of page 15 reminds you where these are on the keyboard and how they look written down on the stave. Figures 10 and 11 below show the correct way to hold your thumb and little finger. Because of their position, these two fingers tend to have an unsteadying effect on the hand whenever you try to move them, and you need to take extra care. Practice moving both for a few seconds, making sure as you do so that your hand remains perfectly still. Now you're ready to have a go at exercise 8 on page 16. Again, this is in 4-4 time with 4 beats to each bar. Listen to the metronome count us in. Exercise 9 is also in 4-4 four, four time. Memories, on page 17, is the first of this lesson's pieces that you play along with us. It uses all five fingers of the right hand and a mixture of the time notes we've learnt so far. Before you try it for yourself, listen to the whole piece played through for you.
it's your turn to play the piano part while we play it through with just the backing. Remember, like the exercises, it's in 4-4 four, four time. So let the four beats of the metronome count you in. the left hand again. This time to play two exercises which use all five fingers. The drawing at the top of page 18 shows how the notes on the keyboard look written on the bass clef. From this you can see that finger number one, your thumb, plays G and finger number five, your little finger, plays C. Unless you're left-handed you'll find that playing with these two fingers is even more likely to unsteady your left hand than it did your right hand. So concentrate extra hard on moving just the fingers and on keeping your hand still. Listen to exercise 10 played through. Exercise 11. In any piece of music, there may be brief moments of silence when no notes are played. In written music, these pauses are indicated by rests. On page 19, you can see that there are several types of rest, each lasting a different amount of time and corresponding exactly to a different time note. For example, a semibrieve rest is the same length as a semibrieve or whole note. That is, it lasts the same amount of time as four quarter notes or beats. And just as with a semibrieve note you get four beats worth of sound, so with a semibrieve rest you get four beats worth of silence. The same rules apply to the other rests. The dotted minim rest lasts for three beats, the minim rest for two beats, and the crotchet rest for one beat. So when you come to a rest in a piece of music, simply stop the sound for the number of beats it represents. In practice, this means lifting your hand and breaking contact with the keyboard altogether. Try this now, making sure the movement comes from the wrist and not your forearm, which should stay steady.
In this second part of the lesson, we'll begin by talking about accent and rhythm. You've probably already noticed that when you count out the beats in bars of music, you automatically give some beats more stress or accent than others. These accents are what give the beats rhythm, one of the most important things in music. In a bar with four beats, the strongest accent is on the first beat. The accent on the second beat is weak, the third beat has a semi-strong accent, and the fourth beat, like the second, has a weak accent. Let's hear how this works now, as we listen to example A, counting aloud as it's played. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. When the music is in three, four time, with only three beats in each bar, the strongest accent remains on the first beat, on the count of one, but the second and third beats are both weak. Hear how this sounds as we count and play example B. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. In two, four time, there are just two beats in each bar, one strong and one weak. Listen to example C. One, two, 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 one, two. One, two. Again, the strongest accent is on the first beat in each bar, on the count of one. Now have a look at exercise 12 on page 20. Here the hands play alternately, and when one hand is not playing, you can see that the corresponding bar is occupied by a rest. A closer look at bars 9 and 10 on the third stave shows that these contain rests for the playing hand too. They both start with a crotchet rest, which makes them sound like this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now let's hear exercise 12 played complete. Exercise 13 is for both hands together, which means you need to synchronise your playing so that you strike the notes in the treble and bass clefs at exactly the same time. This is one of the trickiest parts of learning to play keyboards, so don't worry if you can't get it right straight away. To start with, you may well sound like this. This is how the exercise should sound once you've got your hands playing in perfect time. Now, here's the exercise played complete. Follow it through with the music, and remember, the minim note with the dot is worth three beats. Thank you. 
exercise 14 is written in 3-4 time, so you'll hear three beats of the metronome before it begins. When you practice it yourself, remember when you come to a rest to lift your hand from the wrist, not from the arm. Exercise 15 is in 2-4 time, which means there'll be just two beats of the metronome before it begins. Exercise 16 is designed to help you practice what's called contrary motion, where both hands play together with the fingers moving in opposite directions. Luckily this isn't as difficult as it looks, because the fingering for both hands is identical. Simply let your thumbs play together, then your index fingers, then your third fingers, and so on. Exercise 17 is a piece for four hands, in other words, a duet. First, listen to it played complete. play it with your part missing so that you can join in starting after the four beats of the metronome. Exercise 18 is another piece for four hands, but written in 3-4 time. Here it is complete.
And now, here it is again, this time with the part you play missing. Listen for the three beats from the metronome counting you in. Finally, we come to our second tune for this lesson, In the Snow. This is a piece in 3-4 time for piano and backing group, which uses all five fingers of the right hand. If you like, you can also try playing it with the left hand, or even with both hands together. The notes are the same, only the fingering is different. First of all, listen to the piece played complete. same tune with the backing only. Get ready to play your part, waiting for the three beats of the metronome before you begin. <laughs> 